Hello, everyone. My name is Leanne Wood, and I'm president of Flying Camel PR, and I'm honored to be here today on behalf of both Cosentino Canada and Lixel Canada. I would like to officially welcome everyone to our virtual session entitled Inside the Design Mind, Bringing Luxury to Life with Brian Gluckstein. Today, we're diving into the design of the 2020 Princess Margaret Lottery Show Home located in beautiful Oakville, Ontario. Unfortunately, due to COVID, the COVID world, and I know we hear this every day, but this is the world we're living in, we are not able to visit the home in Oakville firsthand. But our hope is that today's session will give you a great virtual look and you'll still discover some of the incredible features in this year's show home. And judging from the RSVPs to this event, many designers are joining us from outside of the GTA and have the chance to see the home, maybe for the first time. So there's always a silver lining. I'm down the road at my office in Burlington today and not at the show home, but Brian is there. Yes, that is not a Zoom background. It is the real thing. Up front, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's webinar, Cosentino Canada and Lixel Canada, both significant contributors to the 2020 Princess Margaret Lottery Show Home. Both brands have been supporters for a number of years. It's always a tremendous opportunity to support such an important cause. A few housekeeping items to point out. We know that we will have a lot of questions about which products are used when we go through the tour. So we have members from both the Cosentino Canada and Lixel Canada teams using the chat functions to list the products. If you'd like further detail, add your email address to the Q&A function you see at the bottom of your screen and let us know what you're most interested in. At the end of the conversation, we will have time for a Q&A. So please submit any questions you may have, once again, using that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we will do our best to answer everyone during our time together. So let's get at it without further ado, and really no introduction necessary because, well, Brian Gluckstein. Brian, welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for coming. So Brian, I, uh, we're very excited that you're showcasing all your hard work. Um, and you mentioned a stat about the number of people that typically come through the home. Yes, so typically we have 70,000 people that walk through the house. Can you believe it? 70,000 people. So this year, zero. So it is, we've closed the house, but through uh, events like this, we've been able to share the house. So those that are watching this are uh, a few of the select people that will be able to see inside the house the way we're, we're viewing it today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to show it this way because um, you know, we want everyone to see all this wonderful work we've done uh, over the last eight months to get this done. Amazing. And I think there's uh, something else amazing we can talk about too, and that the tickets are actually sold out. Yes, we're a month ahead of schedule. You know, we were concerned because no one can come to the house that we would have a little lag in sales, but this, it's a record year, uh, record sales, record profit for the uh, foundation at the Princess Margaret. The Princess Margaret, um, up until this year, we've raised $400 million for the Cancer Center. So that is an incredible amount of, amount of money for cancer research. And this year we will break a record in uh, sales and, uh, and the revenue for the, the research foundation. That's amazing. Um, everyone involved must be really thrilled. How many years have you actually been doing this project? I've been doing it. This is my eighth house. I can't wow. believe it. Eight houses. Wow, a lot of work. And having worked on the show home for so many years, curious to know, how do you choose the brands that you work with? Well, we want to choose brands that have a point of view that are really going to enhance sort of our design philosophy for whatever the house is that year. This is a, a deco inspired house on the outside and a lot of the details on the inside. So when we're working with sponsors that are generous enough to donate product because we're all in this to raise money for cancer research um, is brands that really have a very strong uh, current point of view, introducing new products that are new to the market, new finishes, um, and work with us to use their products in new and uh, interesting ways. So uh, it's got to be a compelling project. You know, we want the house to be inspiring. 
for the people that see it both in person and in magazines and social media and on television. Um, and it, we were very lucky because it, it is a very inspiring project for people that are either designers or homeowners thinking of uh, renovating or decorating their house. It gives them a lot of ideas. Right. Um, and I think I hear it every year, but um, this home might be the best one yet. Uh, I know. Tell, us about your, <laughs> tell us about your overall design inspiration for this year's show home. And what were some of the initial concept and ideas you had in mind before you started planning out each space? Well, we like houses. The, the lot really uh, drives a lot of the design of the layout because we work in uh, Oakville's a very mature area. We've got beautiful trees and, you know, it's a wonderful area. So we designed the house around a lot of the existing landscaping. Um, we designed the layout. Uh, I like a lot of light. So the houses that we design, and this is probably the brightest house. It is so bright in this house. It is such a pleasure to be in. And I think you know, it's even more relevant today because people are spending most of their time in their houses, both for leisure and work. Um, so we want houses that are bright and airy and, um, and open, but there are private spaces also to get away from the, the rest of the family or your partner. Uh, so uh, the house really works well for uh, the pandemic that we've been in, but it was designed before that. Um, so it's interesting that we incorporate a lot of ideas that are, um, were you know been asked for by clients and we'll go through that when we see different rooms in the house and it just really worked out for this uh, situation the world is in right now. Uh, so we're going to start going through in a minute, but there are a lot of different rooms and different spaces, as you mentioned, yet it has that open feel to it. How did you create each space to be its own different look while maintaining that that flow and openness. <laughs> Well, when you design a house like this for a show house that has so many people through it, you really need an open, a somewhat open plan, but you don't want it so open that when you walk in the house, you see everything at once. So you want a sense of openness because we have a lot of traffic through the house. We have many people through at the same time. So most of the rooms have two or three entrances and exits out of them. Um, and what happens is that's a strategic design element for designing a show house but it really works for an individual's house anyway. It's nice to have different sight lines when you're in rooms. So for instance, this room is a two-story space. Um, I call this the family room, it's the center of the house. And you've got the living room off to the side, you've got the kitchen off to another side, you've got a living room, a dining room and library also. Off. So each one has definition, um, but there is a, a, a nice openness to it. And then we've defined the rooms with color so here in the library, which is open to the foyer and across to the dining room and open to the living room, it's really defined by the color um, and the rugs and things like that because it's the same hardwood that flows throughout those rooms. So that's one of the other elements that defines these spaces through color. Okay, great. And that shot of the home office is actually a great segue to my next question. And Brian, you notice I had to put my glasses on. I couldn't make it through the whole thing. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we are getting the reflection. Um, so I realized this home was designed pre-pandemic, as you mentioned, but considering the changes and how we are now all using our homes from homeschooling to permanent home offices to family staycations, how will this particular home adapt to that? Well, this house really adapts well, and we'll see it with some of the other rooms also. So this, like that room in the lower level was designed as an entertaining space, but that island is a great space to do homework and projects and lay out a lot of your work. And the nice thing about it is you can just leave it there and then go back upstairs. This is in the lower level and leave all your work out there. So you're not staring at it all the time. But between the library and that lower level, there's great um, workspaces. And then I think we showed this one just because of that, um, the great spa area that you created. Yes, yeah, so in, what you know, you need, need to- they need the wine in the last room, but they also need the spa. Exactly. So they need a wine bottle and a straw yeah. and get a tub. And this space is even more important than ever because when you've got a number of people living in the same space at the same time all the time, it's nice to have a room that you can sort of close the door. So here we use this beautiful freestanding tub and then we mix, we mix it with a more traditional um, faucet and uh, 
it, it's just such a wonderful space to relax in. And I did this Japanese screen behind the tub. And I, I love that, that uh, DXV tub because it just opens up the whole space. I didn't want a tub built into a deck. I wanted it to float. And, and again, with the floor pattern that we did in there, there's a lot of interesting floor patterns, but this is a little private oasis that you can just close the doors and pamper yourself. And that's really important in this time. De-stress, de-stress is what we need. Yes, and I think we have a picture of the, um, the DXV bidet as well. And that's been a real trend through, through COVID, even though I think you've been specifying them for a really long time, but people are really understanding the benefits of of the bidet. Yes, you know, we've when we came to our European clients, they have always had that. They really understood that. And um, and when we started introducing, I mean, separate bidets years ago, decades ago in our projects, um, and then when the combination toilet bidet came in to North America, um, it has been an extraordinary hit. And I think it is new for many people. They have not experienced using this. And once they have it, it's a great feature. It also is a real space saver. So if someone doesn't have the space for a separate toilet and bidet, they have this and they can retrofit it. So for the condominium market, this has been a huge advantage because we don't need all the space we typically need. Um, but it's, uh, I think this in plumbing, this is probably the biggest change we've seen in uh, that and freestanding tubs, the biggest change we've seen in the last number of years. It's almost uh, rare that we don't use this toilet in our projects. It's almost every project will have this in the principal bathroom. Yeah, I think once you've uh, tried bidet living, you you really don't go back. I know, like people would laugh at me and they would say, I'd say, oh, you have to have this. I love this toilet. And I go on and they're like, I've never heard anybody love a toilet so much. <laughs> Like, what is it? Okay, we'll have one. Give us one. But it was the whole time I'm like, you have to have it. You just have to have it. So once they have it, people are like, okay, we've got to change this in our cottage or wherever else they have one. But it's it's also so hygienic um, and it also has the light and the seat goes up automatically. So uh, in these times, it's actually a great item to have. Yes, definitely a lot of benefits to that. Um, Let's move to the design styles. Can you tell us a bit about the design design styles you integrated throughout the home? Well, the house, the, the exterior has a subtle deco feeling to it. We've done so many looks for the Princess Margaret show homes. We've done sort of Hampton style shingle. We've done French, we've done English. Um, and we are in an established neighborhood. So we want houses that work well with the neighborhood. And we thought, let's do something that's a little retro deco. So that came into the inside and you can see it in the foyer. We fluted all the walls in this plaster detail. So these huge sheets of plaster fluting came in and they laminated them to the wall. And then we have a Greek key freeze between the first and second level and this beautiful deco inspired fixture hanging down. And it really creates um, a wow moment in the in the foyer. And you see deco details that run through the house. And as we're going through the house, you'll see it. So in this, this is looking down into that family room and the railing is deco inspired details. And then I painted the window black in this room. And you'll see that throughout the house. I painted window frames, different colors. Um, and it, this is this connection between upper and lower. I just love the connection between uh, not only laterally, but vertically. And uh, this is a really wonderful space. I think this is a very uh, a big Instagrammable photo. This one and the one from below, I see it on Instagram all the time. This is really a, a great space and everyone loves the space. And, and when we're in this house, the amount of sun that comes in there and we're because we're, you know, we may be in our houses all winter. So on a sunny day in the winter, there's nothing like sitting by the window and this room is just gonna feel like you're away. I can just imagine whoever wins this house having like a beautiful planted palm tree or something in there and, and really feel like you're outside, it'll be a great space. So open the drapes, open the blinds, let the sun shine in this winter. It is gorgeous. Um, let's go back and start the tour. Let's pretend we are actually walking in the house. We're gonna start back um, at the entryway. The minute you walk in the front door, you're greeted with an elaborate flooring detail, which carries through to many spaces in the house. Can you tell us a bit about the flooring throughout the home? I mean, look at that, it's beautiful. I know, that's unbelievable. So that floor is, that design goes back a few thousand years, believe it or not. We've seen some of the details in this house, even in the, 
the Parthenon. So these are ancient patterns and we used the, uh, the Decton material here, two colors. We had a wonderful fabricator. Can you imagine cutting that all by hand? I actually can't, that is amazing. <laughs> When we did the design, we thought, oh, is he going to do this? Is he going to just throw up his hands? And he came up to the challenge. And I think this is one of those showstoppers. And it shows people that you can take materials and use them in different ways. So you don't have to just buy big slabs or tiles or things like that, but take it and cut it and create something unique to your own home. So here's looking from the front door. You see that incredible pattern. And then we use the full slab um, in the foyer, and here you see it um, in the foyer, we did the baseboards in it, these, I think they're about eight inch high baseboards out of the, the depth in material, which looks like a travertine. It's almost seamless because we use full slabs side to side, and then we clad the staircase in the same material. So the staircase looks so fantastic. It's a very arch powerful architectural detail from, from that standpoint. But the material, this is one of my favorite, and, and I love this material so much. I'm renovating my uh, home in Palm Beach, and I'm using this exact material on my countertops because I'm so in love with it. And I love travertine, but I can't use real travertine in my kitchen. So we're sitting in here, so this is what I'm gonna be using. This is the first and thing I picked, my whole place, is that countertop. Oh, really? <laughs> No, it's amazing too that I'm not sure if, if the audience realizes um, with the Decton um, how it can be used for the flooring and the cladding. People think countertops all the time. Um, it's but the, it's the true. Applications are great. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people think when you're using slab material that use it just in these big pieces and that's it. But there's so many interesting things you can do. So in the foyer, and look at this master bathroom. This also is a very old... Italian pattern that dates back hundreds of years, but we've, it has a very three-dimensional effect and we did it in three colors. Um, and I just love how it looks. So I, I think this will inspire people to think outside of the box, especially for designers. The homeowner themselves may be not as comfortable, but this is where designers have to come in and push the envelope a little bit for their clients and create something truly unique. So we used it here on the floor in three colors. And then we did this warm ceruse oak vanity. It's like nine feet long to warm up the space. And then wallpaper, I love wallpaper in bathrooms. And then the deco inspired sconces um, to bring in again, a bit of a deco feeling. So you see a soft influence of deco in that space, but it really is a wonderful space to sort of lock yourself in. But this is the first place you go in the morning and last place you see in the evening. So it should be a great space and, and a great space to just relax and deal with your anxiety of the world in that tub. And I think every time I look at these images, I see another detail. So it's, it's incredible. So let's go from the bathroom and let's move into the kitchen. And some of the images that I've seen um, show incredible features from a cozy fireplace right down to the gorgeous kitchen sink and faucet. Can you walk us through this space? And we have um, plenty of images to show. Um, and, and go over some of the details that you want that, that future homeowner that you spoke about, that you want that future homeowner to know about. Well, first thing, when it came to the planning, where you see that pantry cabinet at the end, that big pantry cabinet, in the original design concept, we had a wall there with a door to the back entrance and a door across to the dining room. And I decided, let's open up the space. So we did a screen and we did that pantry like a piece of furniture. And then the appliance wall we had the stainless steel hood and the um, big slide in oven. And we did large slab format in silestone um, for the waterfall counter. You can see it goes between the countertop and the oven and between the pantry and the fridge. And then we did huge sheets of it on the backsplash trimmed in the stainless steel to tie it and free floating shelves in the same stone, which I love. Um, so that's a real focal point for the space. And we're doing a lot more of open shelving in kitchens. So I like that balance of open shelving and closed because when you're standing at a counter working, you don't want really a door in your face. You want to have that more openness. So you see that. And then you see the faucet in that, the grow it faucet, um, which is, you know, that's an important element in this kitchen because I wanted people to see that you can mix materials. So even though we have a lot of stainless steel for the hood and the oven, that becomes an element in itself. I was joking today that I have this watch that is gold and stainless steel and you know it's an old watch. 
we have to do that for interiors. So just because you have stainless steel doesn't mean you can't use that beautiful um, soft brass. And then I used the white DXV sink because it just became subtle. I didn't want a metal sink in there. I wanted the faucet to stand out and the sink to really be part of the counter. Mm -hmm. And you can see the countertop. Now look at that island. So the island is not just the top with that big, reverse bevel. So I put the bevel on the underside as opposed to the top. The gables are done in the same decked in material and the dishwasher, the drawers, the doors, even the floor in the niche where the counter stools are, it's all in the same material. So it becomes this monolithic design statement. And I love the idea because we use a thinner format um, for the door and drawer fronts than we did for obviously the counter and the sides, which made it lighter for the doors and drawers. And then we used, um, we did this deco inspired fireplace uh, in the material also different material that's, uh, so we have three of, the, of the, the materials in here and they all are in the same palette and work together, but there's nothing like a fireplace um, in a kitchen. And this, the great thing about the decked in material is that it is, it does not affect it by heat. So we could bring it right to the opening of the fireplace and create that beautiful, um, element. And then on the uh, family room side, we did it in a color called fossil. And it almost looks like a Belgian bluestone, which I use a lot of Belgian bluestone, um, uh, which is a natural material. This is almost exactly the same. So we did another deco inspired fireplace mantle here. So you see the archways on either side when we we're talking about the openness between spaces. The rooms are still open to each other, but defined enough. Um, and you can see right through the fireplace also. So you still define those spaces. We did these dark gray lacquered deep archways, which I love. When I, when I do archways between rooms, I beef those walls up uh, because I don't want a little skinny wall between spaces. So all the archways in this house have that gray lacquer in them. Beautiful. Uh, I know as the, the PR firm for both Cosentino and Lixel, whenever we see these new products like that brush sunrise finish from Grow Up, we, there's a lot of oohs and ahs around the office because you're right, it works so well in that mixed metal environment and the, and the ductin used here is beautiful. So um, and also, you know, I like it because, you know, people often ask me, is brass going to be around for a while? We're used to, you know, brush stainless and things mm -hmm. like that. And I, I think it is if you use it in moderations like, like we did. So we use it as that focal point as the faucet, but I didn't want the cabinet hardware and the light fixtures and everything else done in it. So I think when you have it as an element like this, it's gonna, it's gonna be there forever. I think if we did a lot of brass in some of the accessories and things, it might be too much, but it's how you use it. And I think that's what's important. So yes, you can go bold with a brass faucet where some people might think, oh, I, I never thought about brass in my kitchen. But again, we've used it sparingly, but effectively. Well, the balance is, is perfect, so that's great. Um, now there's a gorgeous little powder room um, just off the kitchen. And I just love the detail that you've provided in, in this. Can you give us a little insight into the design? And I know small spaces are, are always a challenge, but um, can you give us some detail on the inspiration behind this? Well, I give the photographer credit because I don't know how he took pictures of this. I think the <laughs> camera right jammed in the corner. Um, it is a small space, the powder rooms I think should be dramatic. So we paneled the wall with this small trim that we did in this graphic pattern and we wallpapered between. We did another classical floor pattern, same colors as the foyer, but in a different pattern. Again, a old uh, pattern that goes back hundreds of years. And then I did a deco inspired vanity and uh, we use the same countertop as we did in the kitchen because I love it. And then the American Standard faucet. And I chose this American Standard faucet because it, it also has a subtle deco feel to it. It's a really beautiful faucet. And because the vanity is so highly detailed with the fluting in the nickel, it works so well. And we set the stone into the nickel frame and uh, the DXV sink, which I love square sinks. I think I use them most of the time are these square sinks, but look at how beautiful that faucet is into the space. Again, that subtle reference to Art Deco without being too over the top. I think it's really, that's a really classic faucet. I just love that faucet. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and then the wall-mounted toilet, I would say that that is one of the trends we're seeing uh, really take off and not just the, uh, the toilet bidet combinations, but wall-mounted toilets in general. I use them for two reasons. One is they're real space savers because the tank is in the wall. So they project much less out in a space. So in a space like this, if I had the traditional toilet, I would have added another six inches to this because of the tank. So by having the tank in the wall, it was great. Um, also, it, it allowed the floor pattern to be unbroken by having this toilet. And I just find it better for cleaning. I just love freestanding toilets because you can just clean the room so well. And it's, it's so hygienic, but I think this is the future. Um, in Europe again, uh, and in Asia, we're used to seeing wall-mounted toilets. Uh, anytime I'm in France or Italy, most of the toilets have been wall-mounted for decades um, and in commercial spaces. So I think North America is going to see this as a, not just a trend, but that's the future of bathrooms, the wall-mounted toilet. It makes so much sense in terms of space, for sure, and especially in a small space like, like the powder room, but in other areas as well. So let's stick with that bathroom theme. Let's head upstairs, everyone. Come with us. We're heading upstairs to the principal ensuite. This ensuite is exquisitely designed and literally packed with features and functionality. Can you take us through some of your favorite features? Well, I think some of my favorite features are the whole tub area and having that screen behind the tub. So um, in some of the bathrooms, I frosted the glass between the, the toilet compartment and the shower compartment. And here I did this, this almost Japanese inspired screen. And the screen is in the same material, the oak of the vanity. And here you see, so it still allows light into the shower. And here you see the shower, we use the, the slab material, uh, the decton material that we have in the floor. Um, but instead of having the pattern, I did huge slabs of it. So the pattern of the floor goes right through. And I love designing curbless showers. So the shower, when you're planning a house, if you can lower the, the structure in that area, it slopes to the drain. And, and that, that's a big trend with an aging community also. So you don't step over this curb mm -hmm. um, or for um, the community that has disabilities, you know, and they don't want to climb over this. So it's not only beautiful because the pattern goes through, but if someone has any uh, difficulties or if they're wheelchair bound, it looks even better like that. And then create this wide um, soap niche that goes all the way across and then the rain head, which again, we're using more and more all the time. Um, so that's one of the big, uh, I don't even think it's a trend anymore. It just seems like we're using rain heads all the time. But look how beautiful that line is of the tub uh, sitting in front of that screen. And then with the vanity, oh, and then, we, so we mixed it. So what we did is, uh, um, well, the vanity, we did the campaign poles, the traditional campaign poles, but we did them in a polished nickel to make them look a little more uh, modern. And then that large expanse of um, mirror. And we did, again, the same material that we use on the uh, shower wall we used for the counter and did a beautiful step detail on that. And then what we did was I wanted to mix up the fittings. So we did a little more traditional faucets uh, for the tub and the uh, sinks. And I think that works so well with the, um, with the tub uh, because the tub is a very modern bathtub and we've used modern, more modern uh, faucets in other rooms in the house and there's like such an assortment that we've worked with. But here I mixed a little more traditional um, tub filler in this room. So it's a little more eclectic and I want people to think, you know, when you're picking things, everything doesn't have to be of the same moment of design. You can mix traditional and modern up and quite effectively. And there's that screen. So you really get the sense of the screen and you can see into the shower with the shower bench and look how seamless the, the floor goes. And using a, when you do a pattern floor, we tend to use freestanding tubs because they look like elements that have just been placed in the space and allow the floor to look like it's uninterrupted throughout the whole space. Also, it gives a sense of spaciousness. Um, so a lot of people, um, are even afraid to use tubs in small spaces, but we use tubs in all of our principal bathrooms. And uh, the beauty of these is that they don't require the big wide deck around them. So you're getting a more efficient use of space and, and freestanding tubs come 
you know, as small as 60 inches. So you can really get that look in a small space. So I just love that tub. And the tub has a very thin wall to it. So it doesn't take up a lot of space. Had I done an undermount tub and a big deck, I think it would have taken over the space too much. And, and it would have been a little imposing. And I just think how beautiful this looks. And it gives us that spa feeling, which is what we want. We need that room to lock ourselves in, as we said. Away from the kids and away from the home office and everything. So and okay, your part so, um, we'll move along here. We can't forget the basement. And don't flip the slides yet, because I feel like there is a surprise every year. I think everyone remembers the bowling alley from a few years ago and last year's amazing luxury spa. What are you revealing for the bat for the basement um, in the space this year, Brian? Well, this really is perfect for the time we're going through with COVID. And I think the future of home design. So we haven't been able to go to live theater or movies. So we created this movie theater in the lower level. And we have, we did two levels and um, each person gets their own chair and own side table and their own ottoman. Uh, we did vintage movie posters and sort of a, a modern deco theme to the whole room with those stepped ceiling and walls and the LED lighting. I think this is a space that everyone's gonna love and want. And, and the fact that we can't go to movies, this is, you have the movie theater here in your own house, so what could be better? Um, and it's a great use of space in lower levels, especially when you don't have a lot of windows because this area of the lower level didn't have a window. So I thought what better space than create a room that's purposely dark. So I love the space. And then another reason where we can't go to gyms. Um, so we've created our own gym in the space. And this has a particularly large window in the lower level. We did a, a big window well. Um, we used a, a chill witch carpet, which is people are going to say, what is that on the floor? But it's a very durable waterproof carpet. We mirrored the walls. We have all the gym equipment and and this really is of our time, you know, working out at home and the whole idea of wellness and taking care of yourself. And, you know, you're working at home, you're not getting out much, you need to stretch, you need to exercise more than ever. So here it is, you've got it in, in a convenient space in your house. And then the main room that everything flows off of, we've got a wall, a wine cabinet off to the left. We've got this huge island. So this was really designed as an entertaining space or a play space where kids could play games and puzzles. And this was the pre-function space to the theater. We have a seating area at the end, but we've discovered this is the perfect place for everybody to do homeschooling because you've got a lot of room around here. You're not sitting facing a wall. So the kids can be on one side and the parent teacher can be on the other side, uh, but you can really spread things out. And this is a great area, not just to have pizza and drinks and before you go into the movie and have fun, the movie theater, but really a great universal space for working from home. Um, and because we did a glass wall to the gym, all the natural light from the gym flows into this space. So it's a really wonderful space um, and quite unexpected in a lower level. Mm -hmm. Now this, I think is a real, everyone's gonna want this, this is a real, showstopper laundry room, but really it's not just a laundry room. It is a craft room laundry room. So we created a lot of light, a lot of storage. We did the faux wood floor with an inset and mosaic. And then we did the decked on material for the counters and the backsplash. And I like using slab material in high active spaces because of grout, I don't want a lot of grout in these spaces where you might have a pail or you might have laundry and washing and they're splashing. Um, and then we used it on the island uh, table. And that really is not just for folding, but is really a great craft table. And the material is perfect because you can glue on it, you can hot glue on it. It's not affected by heat or paint or chemicals or things like that. So this really is the ultimate craft room because you've got the big sink. Uh, you can't even see there's walls of cabinet for storage. And then I use the white sink. And then I, um, I love the faucet because I love the rubber on the faucet. It doesn't show all your handprints when your hands are dirty, whether you're cleaning something in the sink or doing your crafts. And, um, and you can change that rubber. If someone wants, it can be a, a great color, a fun color. And then I always use racks in kitchens, whether they're kitchens 
or laundry rooms, especially a craft room, because if you're doing crafts, it's a great place to place things in that sink and let them dry. And for arts and crafts, I think it's just a wonderful idea. For kitchen, it's great just to let things drip dry in the sink, but in a craft room, it's great. And then the white sink just flows so beautifully with the countertop, it doesn't break it up. But I've been using more and more colored sinks. We used to use primarily stainless steel sinks in kitchens and, and laundry rooms and utility rooms. Now we're using much more of colored sinks, the white sink, um, and it's fantastic. You know, it really wears well and doesn't show um, the uh, aging of stainless. Stainless is a living finish, so you embrace that. This one, for someone that wants their sink perfect all the time, this is the perfect sink. Great. Okay, I think um, we have one more question. If everyone can remember to use the Q&A function, we're gonna move, move to that um, right after this question. Brian, we mentioned at the top, which is amazing, that tickets have sold out a month ahead of schedule. Can you tell us a bit about how the funds, funds raised will go towards helping cancer research? Yeah, you know, this is such, and people ask me, why do I do this? And it really is a labor of love. I mean, it's an extraordinary project because the pressure to do a house like this, we have to design it, build it, landscape it, and furnish it in eight months. So I don't want anybody calling me thinking they can get a house in eight months. I mean, we really work around the clock. We have to credit all of the neighbors because construction is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the people of Oakville have been so extraordinary because they understand why we're doing this. It's really a labor of love. And everybody working on the house, from the tradespeople that are putting the studs up to the you know, painters, to uh, everybody on the house and all the vendors realize that it's, it's really a very meaningful project. And whoever wins it and lives in it has to really understand that this house is a house really uh, filled with love and all the, the donors that have contributed their products to raise money for cancer research. Princess Margaret is one of the five top cancer centers in the entire world. That's a big statement to make, and that is a big achievement. And we are so lucky to have it here in Canada. And part of what makes Princess Margaret such an extraordinary facility is the research, the patient care, of course, the, the people that work on the front lines in the hospital are the most extraordinary people. It's the researchers also that are really finding breakthroughs in cancer uh, treatments and, and hopefully cures one day. Um, so all the money raised, like I say, we've raised over $400 million for research. And that is an extraordinary amount of money. And Princess Margaret is making world-renowned breakthroughs in the treatment of cancer. Um, and it is extraordinary when we meet uh, cancer survivors from Princess Margaret and what that facility has done and saved so many lives. So um, we thank all of our, uh, our, our sponsors that we couldn't have done it without all of them. And we thank, of course, all the buyers of the tickets. If you don't win a prize, you are still contributing everything to such a worthy cause. You're a winner because you're helping save lives every day. And I think if we were all there in person, Brian, that would be the point where we would all start clapping because that is amazing. So thank you for all of your contributions to that. And uh, we are gonna move to the Q&A, so stay with us because I see some really interesting questions coming in. And um, are we ready? Uh, oh, hi, Martin D'Souza, nice to see you. Um, Martin wants to know how many designers on your team, Brian, were involved in this house? And he has a second question. What was your favorite room to work on? Well, in the office, there are um, just work on this house. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people work on this house um, at, at different parts of it because we've got, you know, we've got to move fast with this and we've got to answer questions fast and work with our vendors fast because we have to deal with you know get product that we can get quickly um, one of my favorite rooms in the house it's hard to say i am a real bathroom person so i love i love relaxing in bathrooms so i think the master bathroom is probably one but i think also the powder room is is a major one i just love that vanity in the powder room and the floors um, and the hall floor I, it's hard to pick because there's so many 
um, and the great room because of the window and all the light. So there's a lot of favorite spaces in here. Well, well, I have to mention, Brian, because you talked about how well lit the house is and you've had this beautiful sun come in over your face uh, throughout this. So there you go. You can see how bright and, uh, and light it is and you're sitting in the kitchen. So that's amazing. Yes. So we had Christine, she actually answered her own question because she asked um, if the tile was porcelain or real marble and then said, oh, Decton, I love it. And I have to add an interesting stat here. I think I might be, you could correct me, but I think there was over 84 slabs um, of Decton used in this in this house. So it's, it's an amazing, all the flooring and fireplaces and everything that you've seen there. Yeah, it's hard to believe, like when we heard the quantity, first of all, we want to thank Decton and Cosentino and Silestone because that is a major, major donation. And we could not have purchased material, this much material. We don't have a budget for that. So when you see the design elements, we really, really, really um, are thankful for our, our vendor partners because we look at those floors and fireplace and mantles and backsplashes and walls of stone. I mean, it really is extraordinary. And for the homeowner that wins this, it's indestructible. I mean, the house is going to look like this in decades to come because you can't hurt this material. So that beautiful, intricate foyer is going to look like that in 20 years. And the same with the kitchen counters and the laundry room counters. And like, look at that floor. That floor can take a lot of abuse. And hopefully when we're finished with this COVID, there'll be a lot of entertaining in this house. So people can come in in the wintertime and not worry about these floors. Look how beautiful that shot is. Um, it's not only beautiful, but it is really a very practical house. So sometimes people see show houses and think, well, they're beautiful, but they're not practical. This is not the case. This house is a very livable, practical house. Great. Okay, so we have a couple questions that are the same. So I'm going to paraphrase. Were there any design challenges or special requirements you had to overcome? And then someone else asked, what was the trickiest design detail to figure out? The trickiest design, I would say the trickiest is the two trickiest design details to figure out. One is this floor that you're looking at right now. We had to keep designing it so that the pattern worked perfectly both ways, both sideways and from front to back. So every square, every circle and triangle, every borderline had to be the same size. So we had to work with the partitions of the foyer, the dining room, the library, and the floor pattern to make it perfect. The other was a challenge. I wanted the island to be completely encased in the stone. And um, so we, had, we were lucky enough to be able to get the material in different thicknesses. So being able to clad the drawer fronts and door fronts and even the dishwasher in um, the stone was a achievement and probably a lot of coordination between the fabricator, the appliance suppliers, and the cabinet makers um, to do that. And even the niche where the counter stools are, it fits in there. And even the floor in that niche where the counter stools are, I took it into that area also. So there was a lot of coordination um, between uh, the Decton, the and all the and all the vendors that worked on it. There's a lot of people that worked on this island. It looks seamless, but that was probably one of the most complicated elements in the house. Okay, um, Barbara wants to know: Is there any radiant flooring in the home? There isn't in this house, but um, we do do it quite a bit. Okay, um, here's an interesting question because I know you've been in business for a very long time. Did you learn anything new on this project? Yes. <laughs> how, to design, how to design remotely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because this house, you know, we've done it before. You know, we did a house that is in, I, I, I wrote a book um, that's out on our projects and people that have the book, um, there's a project in there in Aspen, Colorado. And it's an extraordinary house, very modern house on a cliff on thousands of acres. And I only went to that house three times during construction. It's a very challenging house to get to, especially in the winter and the roads were not plowed. I mean, the road is a mile long, the driveway. So we had to do that through FaceTime and Zoom. We did that house seamlessly. 
so when COVID hit and the site was shut down because only certain people could be in the house at the same time, that's why the house was constructed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because we couldn't have the same crews that we had normally when we build this. We could only have one group at a time. So it was the painter or the floor people. Or, so we were very panicked. How are we going to get this house done? Also for us, we couldn't be in the house when the trades were in the house. Everybody had to social distance. So the house had a lot of visits um, through this format. And that showed that you can do projects anywhere in the world um, with technology nowadays and really well. So I would do sketches and hold it up you know, to the screen and then they'd get it or I'd snap a picture and email it to everybody and everybody would be standing on site with their tape measurements and say, how about this and how about that? So it's extraordinary that this house with all this detail um, was built during COVID when we couldn't go to the house. And I think every designer that's joining us today, um, you know, we've had up to, to 50 people listening today. Um, they probably all have their own COVID stories on how they had to do things differently over the last little while. So um, that kind of segues into another question. How, how long is the process from start to finish um, typically? And, and was it changed during COVID? Well, we have about eight months and eight months is a very compressed time. Eight months to build a house at the best of times would be an extraordinary a house of this size. We've got over 6,000 feet on the three levels, maybe even 7,000 feet on three levels. Um, so a house like this would take double or, or two and a half times the time. Now that eight months includes the design and the permitting. So when we design a house like this in Oakville, we don't go for any variances. This is built within all the parameters of what the code is, the setbacks, the heights, the things like that. And then we design this and it, because of that, we get it through permitting a little faster because there's no variances. And um, we didn't think we could pull it off this year. We really didn't think we could pull it off on time. Um, but this was the um, earliest we've ever finished a house. Um, because we started early before COVID, uh, when COVID hit, we really had a lot of meetings. Um, and because um, we're doing it for a hospital, they're even more sensitive to the safety of everybody involved. So the protocols in this house would be the most stringent protocols of any construction site um, you would ever have. Uh, so we adhere to the protocols and, and we're able to build this. And, the, and my love to all the neighbors, um, and the church across the street that let us park trucks and, and vehicles there and load things in their parking lot, that they were all so supportive of letting us work till midnight and working on Sundays and, and Saturdays and things like that. And we embrace all of our neighbors. And, and again, everyone knows why we were working so hard um, for, for Princess Margaret. So I think people were you know, very understanding and very cooperative. And the vendor takes the community, so everyone, you know, everyone joined in. So that's amazing. People would walk by and wave when we were there, and thumbs up to us, and it was really a, a lovely. It's always a lovely experience to that. Uh, uh, the neighbors are so wonderful. In past uh, uh, times, we've had you know coffee with the neighbors on the lawn during construction, and just give them little tours and things like that. We couldn't do that this year, but um, uh, they still uh, embraced us as ever before. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Well, I like, I just, I'm seeing some of the comments come in and some of the chat. Um, everyone's saying they love it. Um, every, every bit of it. Um, Massimo Bellucci from, uh, he's here from Miami from Cosentino said, thank you, Brian, you captured the essence, beauty, durability, and all the applications of our products. And I know Lixel feels the same way. So unless there are any other questions, there's some specific ones in here. And I really encourage people, if it's very specific about uh, something, to reach out um, to the uh, to the Lixel or the the Cosentino teams. So I'm going to wrap up. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you were inspired by the beauty of the design and the unique treatments. So much to take in, and we mean it when we say that both Cosentino and Lixel Canada are happy to answer any specific pro uh, product questions. So please reach out. Brian, thanks again for your incredible contributions uh, to the Princess Margaret cause and spending the time with us today. Um, honestly, it's just outstanding. Thanks to your team, the Gluckstein Design Team, and a big thank you to Cosentino Canada and Lixel Canada for making it all happen. Um, Brian, do you wanna say a few, few words before we sign off? 
I just want to thank everybody again and thank uh, Cosentino because we couldn't have done it without them. And um, we're so proud of it. And we're so proud that the community has rallied around the house and in record sales, record dollars. We're a month ahead of schedule with the ticket sales sold out. And, um, and remember that every contribution we've done may save a life. Amazing. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. And we will see you in person at next year's Princess Margaret Lottery Show Home. Have a great day. Thanks.